during this era that we shot, we felt very, very. So first of all, um, again, it's so nice to meet you. And a first question for you, tell everybody what you do and about this really a great movie called Jesus Revolution that's coming out. Well, my name is Brent McCorkle. I, I grew up kind of uh, an indie filmmaker on the street and realizing I was in Dallas at the time when I realized, well, I'm going to have to just learn it all. So I became a bit of a, a Swiss army knife. You know, I learned how to write and edit and direct and score. And uh, I was a musician before I started chasing film. And so, uh, so yeah, it was a natural segue into uh, film scoring for me. And so I just tried to learn it all and do the best I could. I did a bunch of short films in Texas and I ended up making a few that got some attention and I got to make my first feature film in 2012. And uh, soon after that, I started working uh, a lot with John and Andy Irwin. And those guys are so cool. They, they really you know, want high quality stuff. And I really fit in with them because that's what I wanted to do too. So I've done five projects with them. And John was looking for a co-director on this, just someone to get it across the finish line. And I, I loved this concept. We've been trying to do this movie for seven years. Uh, it was set to go off a couple of times before we actually made it this time. And, and one time, of course, the pandemic, and then another time it got put on hold because Lionsgate was coming into the picture and we were you know, looking at new titles for them. So on the third try, we actually got to make the film and, uh, and the, you know, the times aligned where I was a person that could jump in with John and, and make the film with him as the director. And it's just been an amazing, amazing journey. I think this film is what the world needs right now. It's just full of kindness and hope and love and compassion. And uh, it's a feel good movie. Uh, no one pulls out a gun on anybody. I mean, it's just, it, it's just a very sweet little movie that I think is going to touch a lot of hearts. And it really is about, um, you know, in the Christian faith, there should be enough love for everyone. And that's kind of what this movie's about. I loved the movie. A lot of times people say, ah, oh, the trailer gives away so much of the movie. But when I saw this trailer, and when I saw the movie, I did not expect more than half of the stuff in the movie from the trailer. Like the trailer was very feel good. And the movie was very real. And I love, was that an intention for you guys? Don't ask directors about trailers because they'll trash them all. You know, like I'm the wrong person to talk to about trailers because we're always like, don't give that away. Oh, that's the best scene. Uh, nah, nah. You know, so that's why they take the trailers away from directors oftentimes. Like we're, you know, we were not, that was the Lionsgate trailer. So, uh, and I actually, I actually really warmed up to it. I think it's a pretty awesome piece of work. Um, I, I do feel like what they did with the trailer was important because they nailed the theme. They nailed the theme. Like it really is this beautiful, inclusive theme of love and belonging. Uh, and finding belonging in a place where you wouldn't expect between these two really disparate groups of people. You have really square, hyper-conservative Christians. You have these crazy hippies that many of them had never even been in a church before. Somehow figuring out a way to mesh together and you know, find this new faith together. And both, both uh, people groups take on faith was changed through, through that. And so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm the most, like I said, I'm the worst person to ask about the trailer. Cause I think, you know, every, every director's out there is like, man, you just poached all the greatest parts of the, you know, but I really do feel like I, I really warmed up to it. And I think it's a wonderful trailer and it's getting tons of feedback. So I've had to kind of shut my mouth and, and, um, and realize that it, it's, it's, it's a good trailer. It really is. What was so interesting about this story specifically that it had to, that had to be told. Nobody knew this story really, other than the people that lived it. Um, and like what it ended up becoming was huge in America, but it started out really small. And so John Irwin, when he was prepping for Woodlawn, which I don't know if you saw that film or not, but it's really cool. It's a, it's a racial reconciliation film. Um, it really is a beautiful, loving movie as well. But he discovered, he saw something online that showed the Jesus Revolution Time Magazine cover. He's like, I wonder what that is. So he started looking around and, Time Magazine didn't have it digitally archived or anything. So he's like, I wonder what that article is. So he found a collector's item copy on eBay and bought it for like $150. And when he read this article, he, he pointed out, he's like, this is the next movie. This is what I want to do. And so John really discovered it. And then he tasked me with um, 
doing some deep dive research and I watched tons of documentaries, read a bunch of books and started compiling things that we could add into the movie to make it even more robust and cool. And that's where I discovered that um, Chuck Smith had done just these beautiful acts of kindness and service in a really Christ-like way to include these hippies to the consternation of his church leadership. They were not about it, you know? So that was a really, it's a cool clash there to see this this cultural warfare happening uh, at, and Chuck is just cutting through all of it. It's like, no, this needs to be love. You know, this needs to be about love. So yeah, John Irwin, man, uh, discovered it, uh, read the article and it was, you know, when you're looking for your next movie, it really does feel like you're burying for, I mean, you're, I'm sorry, when you're looking for your next movie project, it feels like you're digging for buried treasure or trying to dig up old dinosaur bones or something. It's like, it's not just evident in front of you uh, so when he read that article and knew he wanted to do it, um, everybody pays attention. I mean, if, if, a, if a filmmaker comes and says, guys, I have to do this, then there's probably something there to really, really entertain. And so, um, so yeah, here we are seven years later and, you know, got the, got the movie made and uh, it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful film about love and hope. And I really think it's going to have a, an impact on our country. We, we have such a dark and divided country right now everyone trying to cancel each other, everyone being judge, you know, super judgmental, the most judgmental in the culture I've ever seen on either side. And um, this is, movie is a call back to love. Uh, and I, I think it's gonna just be this kind of warm, toasty marshmallow s'more at the fire that everybody needs right now, you know? What I loved about the movie was um, the fact that it told some really true stories. And I, I know Greg has been very open about his past and obviously to what he is now, it's a huge contrast. So how was how important was it for you guys to be as authentic as possible when it came to his story um, or any others who kind of struggled in the film? It's cool. Um, I, overwhelmingly, it's been positive. Uh, I, I think, you know, not and not citing any film specifically, but I think Christian films in general have a bit of a propaganda problem where they're not authentic. They're not vulnerable. They don't tell the full story and everything gets wrapped up with this cute little pretty bow at the end. And that's not real life. And, and one of our high value targets in this particular story was vulnerability and authenticity. And we really had to tell it how it rolled out. We had to honor everybody's character, but at the same time, tell the true story. And as it pertains to Christianity, John, John's main theme, our themes were different. It was beautiful because I brought my, all my themes in and John brought his in and they're, and they're both fully actualized in the movie. But John's big theme is God uses broken people. You, we've sold ourselves a bill of goods. We've sold ourselves down river that you got to go to church and, and get all perfect and read the Bible and be able to quote the Bible and go to go to Bible study and, and you know, listen to podcasts and read your Bible all the time. You don't have to do any of that. You, you that's not your job. You know, so my wife always says, you know, it's the spirit's job and we don't give the spirit enough room to work in our culture. And so, yeah, so John's big theme was. God uses you where you are in your brokenness, in your messed up, fallen state. He can use you. And that was his theme in the movie. And it really shows up. I think it's really beautiful. And actually, quite frankly, I think it's biblical. I, I think it's actually more biblical uh, to tell it that way than to whitewash everything and tie it up with a really cute ribbon and a bow at the end. So, so yeah, it was it was very, very um said us you know it was i'm sorry let me back up it was it was very important that we made it authentic and vulnerable that was a value from the beginning you guys got jonathan rumi to star in this fans of the chosen will definitely recognize him in this movie um was it just a first thought to have hey he plays jesus and he kind of looks like this guy who's kind of acting like he would love to be Jesus. Yeah. How did you guys get Jonathan to be a part of this film? Actually, we just believed in Jonathan and his acting ability. Uh, John Irwin, especially. John was like, man, I think this guy has range. I think we should get him. And it's a crazy departure. And while you have 
the externality of this this dude who's kind of got a messiah complex and trying to look like jesus we really wanted him for his acting um <laughs> and he he went as far as you could go i mean he he i don't know if you know uh, like method acting but like he lost 20 pounds and went to lonnie's grave like prayed on lonnie's grave and asked god to help him like do the role right or if he's even supposed to do the role um he changed his voice he got with a vocal dialect coach he dyed his hair three times and uh and uh the third time he threatened to do it himself because because the salon wasn't getting it exactly like he bring, bringing pictures like it's got to look like Lonnie frisbee's hair color and uh the third time he threatened to do it himself like okay okay so they sent him a really really good guy they finally got it but um but he was very protective of Lonnie, Lonnie's story. And he was very, very dedicated to bringing the role to life in just a beautiful way. And he used every tool that he knew as an actor to bring something new and fresh. And I know when people, the Chosen fans, when people first see him, they're like, oh man, you know, but you quickly forget because he's just bringing you, you know, some completely different radio frequencies uh, than his Jesus and the Chosen. And we knew he was going to do it. We knew he's going to do it. And I defended all of his, his method type things um and i'll tell one quick story about lonnie he uh jonathan demanded to be called lonnie on set he didn't want to break character so even in between takes you know we would call him lonnie and i realized he had done it to me when i i pulled my phone out to send him a funny meme and i typed in lonnie in my phone and i was like oh man dude you just got me so so you know on set on during the day i had lonnie frisbee with me and it was uh it was really cool and there's no doubt that he is an amazing actor with a ton of range. And I think it's great for him, even in his career, right. To see uh, for people to see him do something different, because I think we're going to see a lot of great projects come out of Jonathan Rumi acting uh, and not just the chosen. So I think it's great for him to have this moment to show everyone, you know, that he can do something different. And on top of that, he just portrayed Lonnie so beautifully. You care about him. You love him. He's very lovable. He's a very flawed human being. But his portrayal of Lonnie, I think, uh, is a lot of the concrete that cements the film together. Speaking of Lonnie, it seemed that maybe they didn't show a lot of Lonnie's story. I think he maybe struggled with homosexuality. Was there um, a reason for that? There was a lot of talk about it during this era that we shot we felt very very compelled and almost convicted to just be with Lonnie where he was at and not try to bring in you know other things so that is going to be a controversial choice that we made but that was just our thing it's like okay who was Lonnie in 1969 and 1970 we're going to stay there so he was married to Connie um they had a turbulent uh relationship and um and we played it with the Lonnie that we know historically was happening in 69 and 70. Now, are there many different Lonnie's and many different stories and many different eras of his life? Yes. And we, we start to kind of see some things like not all is great in uh, Emerald city, you know, kind of thing with him, even in our movie. And so, um, so yeah, that was a conscious choice for sure, but he had a lot of struggles. Uh, he came from a really broken background um, he did a lot of drugs. He did a lot of LSD and hate Ashbury. Uh, he was also just a very mercurial artist. Um, so he just had, uh, I'm an artist, I'm mercurial too. So he had a lot of things, right, you know, stacked against him, I guess, but, um, just a beautiful soul, a beautiful soul, big ego, uh, wouldn't listen to people. And yet, uh, one of the most gifted, um, seers and uh you know christian ministers of our time so um so our, we felt like if anything um uh, another thing i would add to this is there have been pe christian people because of his background that have gone to great lengths to erase him out of their history to eradicate him to the point that they've gone into their literature and reprinted it without his name on it and we were upset about that i'm not gonna lie and we're like no we're not doing that and so we tried to bring forth the most accurate, honest Lonnie that had massive giftings that were undeniable and put him out there in the world and reinstate him back into the story in the way that we felt was honoring to him uh, and also told the true story of what was going on in his life in 69 and 70. 
Yeah, I think that you guys did a great job in that aspect. I studied apologetics uh, back at Biola. And what I Biola. love about so you know Biola. And in the logic class, I'll never forget whether or not you agree with the person and what they did or how they live their life is what they are saying true. So if someone is a drunkard, but is saying Jesus died and rose again, did Jesus die and rise again? That's the question. If we're going to tell the truth, right? If the truth is the truth, no matter what, whoever was a part of it should be a part of it. And we shouldn't go back and erase things. In regards to Lonnie's character, um, you did show the other side of him that we will see later. Thanks, man. You've just... You just have like blown my brain up with stuff I want to talk about because I'm I'm totally vibing with everything you said. Uh, you actually just shocked me back to a movie that I saw that I thought was amazing, but it's this Steve Martin movie in the '90s called Leap of Faith. Okay, and he's a charlatan. He doesn't even believe. He he doesn't believe, and he does all this stuff to trick people and manipulate people for money. He's just he's just raking in money. He doesn't believe any of it. And at the end of the movie, though, this crippled kid comes up to the front and like touches the feet of Jesus. He had the statue of Jesus, touches the feet of Jesus. Immediately he's healed. He can walk. And it shocked, it shocked Steve Martin's character. And he's like, I, I have to blow town. And they're like, why are you leaving? He goes, because I can't compete with that. That's real. And that was very powerful to me because he created an environment where people could believe. And we have to believe the spirit is at work all over the earth. So even this charlatan that created this like false reality or whatever, this kid actually can still have a real miracle there. So it's less about the humans and like we get where, you know, we're trying to cancel everybody. We're judging everybody. But I love what they said in the film. It's like, well, if God is real and the spirit is real, even the charlatan dude that creates a space, even though it's fake, people can access their faith and they can touch something that's much bigger than them. And I just love what that movie had to say. Uh, is the Martin smoked it i mean he was just amazing in the film so so yeah i completely agree with you because like you said the drunkard that is talking to people about jesus he has a part in him that broke and we could probably take that back to his family of origin or some kind of trauma or he was in the war and saw terrible things he, just, he had some bad things happen to him or he has a genetic propensity towards it or a combination of both those are human broken traits but that has nothing to do with the pure spirit that surrounds all of us and when you are talking about that you can't taint that you can't change you know you can't damage this pure thing that's above all of us little humans so we need to look at that separately be like oh this, that person needs help that person needs healing in that area of their life and but i mean honestly if you get real about all the heroes of faith in the bible it's like a lot of it's a lot worse than someone with a drinking problem so i just think we need to get more real about the brokenness in humanity and separate that out from how pure the spirit is and how amazing that that is above us all and around us all and and uh not um not affected by our brokenness as humans what do you hope that the audience can take from this film that it was very relevant back then when it was told and it's super relevant today. Yeah. So this is my, this is my soapbox. This is the, this is the drum that I bang, but there's no room for hate in faith. Uh, you know, I, I've been reminded what Paul said. He said, there's three things in the universe. They're the most incredible things ever. It's faith, hope, and love. But above all three of these is love. And I vibe out with that because I think right now a lot of people are putting their faith over everything and they're really mad about, you know, people across the aisle from them politically and all these things. There's no room for that. We're called to love. We're called to be bearers of light. We're even called to love our enemies. And that that verse scares me because I may have only seen four people in my life do that. So that's the stuff I hope that this movie calls people back to. I, I hope it's a call back to love. I hope people go home and be like, hmm. We're leaving people out of our church just like they did back then. We're actually on the wrong side of this equation. How can we balance this equation? How can we be more like Chuck Smith? Chuck Smith did radical things to reach those kids at the peril of his own job, like possibly like losing his his own uh, losing his house and you know his way of income. He put it all on the line for these kids because he was called to love them and. I just hope we open up our hearts and really look inside 
and start understanding that the culture in which we live in with all the judgmentality and all the hatred, it's actually permeated the church right now too. And like, we've got to get ourselves back out of that. That we'll know we are Christians by our fill in the blank. Like what, what is the thing you're doing that is trying to make you look like a Christian? Are you like yelling at people that opposed you politically on Facebook or, you know, they will know be, but sorry, they will know we are Christians by our love. And it's just that simple. So I really feel like, for me, this movie is a love letter out to the world, but also to the church. How can we be a love forward people? Because what the world needs most right now is love. Exactly. We need Jesus and, you know, God is love. And I think what I loved about Chuck Smith is, yes, he extended the hand to people who acted or looked different, but he didn't change the truth of the gospel. And we want to share the gospel and share the truth of the word of God in grace and in truth. And he was able to get to a point where he could do both of that without watering down the truth. Um, but also taking the truth to people like Jesus did himself. Jesus went to people, right? They came to him, but he also went to them and he met him where they're at. And with the truth of him, of himself, um, he changed their lives. And so I think that that's something that we could all learn today is to have the gospel and share it in love and um, reach out to people who may be different than us. But if we know the word of God and we stick to his truth, we're not going to change it. We're going to change the world by the grace of God. If you like Christian films or films that deal with faith, go see this movie opening weekend. It's February 24th. And that's really how you vote. Bring a friend. I will say uh, not bragging. No, no. All, all humility. But like we worked really hard on the craftsmanship of this film to make a film that you won't be embarrassed to take friends to. It feels like a Hollywood movie. It moves like a Hollywood film and uh, the quality is great. So We've, we're finally kind of bringing you a movie where you're like, okay, this this is, you know, this this pat this makes the grade because, um, yeah, just give it a chance, give it a shot, but 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 definitely go see us opening weekend. We'd really appreciate the support and and the opening weekend really determines the full run of show and like how long it stays in the theaters and how many screens that they stay open on and and that kind of thing. And then if you want to get a hold of me, I love Instagram. Uh, so it's just my name, Brent McCorkle, B-R-E-N-T-M-C-C-O-R-K-L-E. And finally, you know, and finally, this the thing I would say to you is I, I love your heart. I love everything you're saying. Um, Jesus skipped church <laughs> to go be with people. And when he would tell stories, he would choose the craziest other, you know, like this marginalized ethnic group or you know somebody you wouldn't expect and he's like oh well here's here's what the kingdom of god is like it's this thing from a person that you wouldn't expect and that's what i love about our story it's actually what i love about chuck and lonnie and greg it's these people just trying to do the right thing and be led by the spirit and maybe people you wouldn't expect to be a part of the greatest spiritual awakening that has ever happened in america